Over the past 100 years, the standard urban development model of the world's cities has shifted radically. Prior to the 20th century, cities across different cultures and historical contexts tended to develop from the bottom up incrementally without a huge degree of central coordination. But things started to change as we entered the age of the automobile, and planning restrictions which aimed to improve quality became ever more prescriptive. In today's conversation, I talked to Arizona-based property developer Kelly Lannan and president of the Free Private Cities Foundation, Rahim Takhazadga. We discussed the history of city development, what it's like for a modern developer to operate within the 21st century planning system, and whether there's an argument for rethinking some of the fundamental principles we have about the way in which cities grow and are maintained. So Kelly, tell us about yourself and why you became interested in the urban planning system. So I, I grew up uh, here in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, my dad was a home builder for about 35 years. So I have essentially spent my whole life either uh, on a job site or in the office. And um, I have kind of always been uh, more inclined to do real estate. Uh, I kind of wanted to be an architect as a kid, but that didn't really uh, pan out. So uh, I had been working with my dad full time since about 2011. And I started to become more interested in how essentially the built environment came to be, so to speak. And it didn't really occur to me uh, to think about and dive deep into how we got here until I went to uh, uh, the West Village in Manhattan in 2017. And I had never really seen a city or a town kind of like that. You know, you've got um, a compact area with three, four story brownstone homes. Uh, narrow streets, there's trees on the streets, there's lo lots of walking, you know, I could, I could leave uh, the place I was staying and, you know, come across 10 times as many uh, services or restaurants or um, businesses than I could ever have come across in the same amount of time at home if I had to get in my car and drive somewhere. So that's what led me to believe when I got or led me to question when I got home, you know, why, why is Phoenix not like Manhattan at all? You know, how did this how did this built environment that we have today where I have to drive everywhere in Phoenix, you know, essentially in suburbia, how did this come to be? Um, you know, obviously 120 years ago, Manhattan was uh, uh, a burgeoning city that was growing leaps and bounds in that, you know, how did they plan it this way? You know, is this a planning deal? Did the government just decide that they were going to build Manhattan the way Manhattan is? And as I dove into um, basically why, I found out that no, this is, you know, Phoenix, Phoenix is part of what's called the suburban experiment in that this is not ever how cities develop. This is all brand new. We're trying all of this for the, the first time, you know, although uh, cars are a relatively new invention, you know, do we necessarily want to build a city around, you know, vehicle transportation? It's very expensive to do. It takes up a lot of space. There's capacity issues. You essentially plan for um, the greatest demand, which is a very short time window. And then the rest of the time, it basically just sits there. So I had just begun looking at all of these different things and the experiences I had working uh, with my dad as a kid up till now. And that I, I just wondered why, you know, how, how did we get here and why are we doing it like this? So that's what really piqued my curiosity um, to look at. Uh, how the build environment comes around, what patterns we're using, uh, why do I have to go through the processes I do in order to build, you know, somebody a home. And um, that was essentially the beginning of my rabbit hole. And now, you know, I kind of write a little blog about my experiences and thoughts and uh, in conjunction with Bitcoin, um, some of the things that I think will occur in the future. So you're kind of coming at this from a family of people that have worked in development and in construction. And so you've got their perspective on what's going on in Arizona and, and how that differs to some of the countries, uh, sorry, to some of the cities on the east coast of the country. Um, and so when you went into development, how did um, this sort of understanding of the history of development uh, kind of changed the way in which you went about your your work did it did it at all did it did it um make you want to try and copy this this mixed use lower density so higher density model that you saw in the east 
Yeah, I mean, I would love nothing more than to build, you know, three and four story brick buildings on Main Street uh, with mixed uses and, um, uh, you know, all of the different, uh, they, they call it uh, uh, oh, granular uh, property development where you are developing smaller spaces for essentially smaller needs. You know, you don't need to build a 800 unit apartment complex when you have, uh, you know, 50 buildings instead. So I, I began to see what we currently do in the development world as we are functioning within a sandbox of things that we're allowed to do that the city prescribes or uh, the county prescribes or whatever governing authority happens to have uh, somewhat of a control over your parcel. And that, you know, 100 plus years ago, like none, none of this stuff existed. There was no zoning board. There was no design review. There was no city council approval on whether or not, you know, you could build a, a hardware store. Um, so I, I began to see how essentially how far we've strayed from the original um, city uh, pattern, city development patterns, in that all of the things that we do to now is essentially on a permission basis. So you have to go and get approval uh, to use something. And not only that, you also have to get approval to do something within the building. So like if you wanted to open a coffee shop in a building, you had to go and get a use permit in order to use that building. So I essentially don't wanna say I, I pulled my hair out, but once I began to see the difference, it was, it was quite shocking that there's very little free entrepreneurial decision-making in, um, uh, the development and uh, construction world that we have today. Everything's very prescribed. There's very much uh, a linear uh, process where you have to qualify for steps A, B, and C before you can move on to D, E, and F. And that there's no guarantee that just because you've made it through those three steps that you'll make it through the next three. You know, you have to uh, essentially adapt to what you've got to work with. And that's essentially what, you know, the built environment is a result of today. It's, it's uh, getting, getting as many boxes checked as possible in order to just get through. So I, uh, I became a little misanthropic, but uh, there's always light at the end of the tunnel um, that you can uh, work through processes. You can convince people to uh, look at new information or a new model of doing things. And that, uh, that's, uh, that's where I am today. I want to just turn to uh, Raheem for a moment and ask him about uh, some of these trends. So Kelly, you've just given this kind of description of working as a developer and the, how the processes have become longer and more complicated and more prescriptive over time. And uh, Raheem, I understand that you're um, kind of proposing a different model for, uh, for, for cities, which would be much less prescriptive in terms of what would be possible for urban planning. Um, can you tell us what some of the, how you view these prescriptive planning policies that Kelly's describing? Um, do you think they have any advantages um, or do you think that these are um, kind of slowing down development and raising cost for, for people that want to, to buy houses or start businesses or undertake construction projects? Well, the interesting thing is that the developments are fairly similar all around the globe. I mean, we have the same extension of uh, regulatory delays in Europe uh, and many places. So uh, it seems like there's something else uh, behind that. And I may offer a reason for uh, what uh, we are seeing here. Um, I think it's a combination of uh, incentive structures and the monetary system. Uh, and on the one side, the incentive structure is an insight. It's usually attributed to Marx, uh, but that's wrong. It was actually some predecessors of the Austrian School of Economics in the French tradition who came up uh, with class theory as basically seeing that different parts of the population have different economic interests and use regulatory capture to siphon off wealth uh, and foster the interest not uh, consciously usually but uh, usually in an unconscious way so they are rationales and uh, of course it pays to have good reasons so there are always good reasons for this kind of regulations and uh, the intentions uh, usually are quite good in the beginning and early on uh, but uh, what is happening of course we have an increasing class of uh, people siphoning off wealth in, I would call them parasitic professions. So, I mean, I, it's nothing against those people in person. And that's very important to understand about this uh, uh, class theory and systematic theories, a systematic way of looking at uh, 
uh, economic structures. Uh, it's not that those people are more evil or, or more stupid uh, than the rest of us. It's just uh, if we don't pay attention uh, in a complicated society, uh, it offers opportunities uh, for people uh, to, well, siphon off the uh, uh, incredible amount of wealth that uh, can be created due to cooperation by people. And uh, usually, of course, there would be some pressure. I mean, if you would have costs increasing and delays uh, uh, tripling and, and uh, uh, multiplying by 10 and so on, there would be cost pressure. Uh, and this cost pressure usually would put the burden of discipline and, and restricting that. And, and that's where the monetary situation comes in the monetary system. Uh, basically, the increasing costs and the decreasing marginal returns in real estate are have been compensated by the increasing uh, supply of money and by the decreasing interest rates. And thus, uh, it has become possible to siphon off more and more of this wealth without people really realizing because you have increased valuations in real estate and thus increased capacity uh, to finance uh, those projects and to pay off larger and larger swaths of the population uh, as notaries, as lawyers, as uh, planners, uh, even uh, in, I mean, in less structured countries, a uh, larger part is paid off in poor corruption or, or bribes uh, uh, and real estate is rife of corruption. And in the more developed places like the US and Europe, a lot of that is systematic white corruption, you can call it, uh, which is not an obvious bribe, uh, but definitely it's providing uh, jobs in particular to academics. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, no, <laughs> it's not by chance that the money supply is closely linked to the supply of academics. That's not a term I've heard before, actually, white corruption. So th the idea then would be that people are kind of benefiting parasitically from a system, but in a way that is not through kind of doing some undertaking some illegal practice, but it's just because they understand the institutions, understand the processes, and they're able to gain some benefit, such as a high salary, lots of prestige from, uh, uh, from engaging in a certain kind of activity. Well, it's not even necessary to understand it. I mean, <laughs> you can have no idea about the economics, but still it works. And uh, it's a mixture of kind of privilege and cunning, and but also the situation you are at. Uh, I mean, it's closely, it's a kind of privileged situation. It's, I mean, it's much more likely if your parents have been part of the class to be of the class as well. Uh, that's <laughs> the highest correlation between your parents being academics and yourself being an academic. And uh, uh, the job description may change. <laughs> but uh, the role usually remains more or less the same. Uh, are you part of that privileged class siphoning off more uh, of the wealth that is redistributed mainly to the country on effect, uh, uh, which, which is why it's closely linked uh, to the monetary system. Yeah. And um, so in terms of, the, of these ever ever growing regulations around planning, it sounds good in principle, doesn't it, that you would have better quality housing. But of course, in economics, there are always trade offs. If you want something to be better in one respect, you can't magic resources that wouldn't otherwise exist in, into, uh, into reality by just mandating that the quality is higher. It necessarily costs more and necessarily diverts resources from one area of the economy towards the area of the, the economy that you're trying to, to privilege. So how does kind of looking at this problem of real estate through a kind of Austrian economics lens um, provide insight into what, um, you know, why it might not be such a good idea to be really prescriptive about the quality of housing that, that people have, Raheem? Uh well, the interesting thing is that uh, it's not the case there's just too much planning. I would say in certain respects, there's too little planning because a lot is planned by, planned by central uh, agencies uh, and they replace the more uh, bottom-up small-scale planning uh, that used uh, to be a part uh, of, of uh, urbanization before. Uh, so, of course, if you look at it, it seems as if there have been partly more prescriptions in the past uh, than in the present. Uh, uh, but uh, the difference is that they are closely 
uh, linked uh, to small scale developments where you have a general aesthetic agreement uh, and uh, usually natural necessities of, of hydrology and so on, which lead to a more bottom up way of following prescriptions and of course uh, keeping in mind the limitations that you have that are imposed by nature or by society if you want to live together. Uh, so uh, the, the Austrian school uh, is unique in paying a lot of attention to the factor of time uh, in economics uh, and uh, there I mean one of the main differences uh, is between uh, how long the term is uh, that you look at this planning uh, perspective or development perspective and uh, the term Austrian economics uses time preference. Uh, so one crucial difference seems to be that a lot of modern planning seems to be short term uh, planning and just looking at short term results. Uh, whereas if we look at uh, uh, city builders of the past, it's amazing that most of the magnificent buildings that have survived have been built for eternity where even the artisans constructing then I did not live uh, to see the completion of the buildings that they were working on, uh, which is a sign of very long term orientation and, and planning. And basically, of course, that's meant by the term sustainability, which comes from economics. It's uh, having a low time preference approach, uh, which uh, uh, helps to prevent capital consumption and uh, increases or uh, highlights the importance of gradual capital formation over the very long term. Uh, and of course, uh, cities are a concentration of capital structures, of infrastructure, and the most uh, long term things that human beings have been able to build. And it's amazing how long cities have survived and are able to survive uh, if there is this link uh, between capital formation and not short term consumption of what has been built by past generations. I want to turn back to Kelly now and um, make a point about the, um, you know, whether it whether it's the case that we've we've got people in the past that were planning with longer time horizons or whether um, there's some different kind of dynamics going on as well, because I know in Kelly's blog, um, Bitcoin Urbanism, um, Kelly, you've drawn on uh, the book Strong Towns quite heavily in lots of your writings. And one of the things that Strong Towns uh, the book uh, says, is that in the past, cities were uh, built in a much more bottom-up way rather than centrally planned. And in a way, the buildings would have, in some sense, like a shorter time horizon. You would build like a, a shack or something, and this shack would develop a small community around it. And as those agglomeration benefits accrued, there would gradually be enough capital for that shack to be upgraded or maybe demolished completely. And then something bigger and bigger and bigger would be built. And the book talks about how uh, Manhattan was built in that way and lots of medieval cities were built in that way. Um, so Kelly, I wonder if you can say a bit about, about that process and um, how that kind of relates to, to time preference. Um, what's your view of kind of time preference and its and its impact on, on that strong town's um, description of, of urban development in the past. Sure, so I guess to, to approach it from the situation where we are now, when you have a, uh, a municipal, uh, like a local government planning board and they tell you what you can and can't build, it's a very, it's a very short time frame in which they're thinking about doing things. Often it's either uh, political or uh, in the case of Arizona, every 10 years your city has to, uh, uh, generate what's called a general plan. So they they plan out their city and how it should look for the next 10 years. And then, you know, on the minutia level of each parcel, you can kind of play within those rules. So I, I like to say that it's very short term planning and the fact that you, you get done what you can get done for that one job over the course of however long it takes you to approve. And then it's essentially cast in stone until whoever can afford to go through the process again in 10 years is able to go through the process. So it's, it's, it requires much less planning than if the private market were to do it themselves on an individual property basis. Raheem had mentioned this, and it's, it's very similar. I like to say it's casting buildings in amber once it's approved. And then you have to go and spend all the time and the money and the labor and resources, just all the things that you have to go through in order just to change that just a little bit. Um, and it doesn't really work because you have to have a step function change in the, the intensity of the use of the land that you're doing. So for example, if we start with your, your little wooden shack on a brand new main street in the middle of um, you know, middle America, 
you wouldn't be able to tear down your shack and build a two-story wood building, okay? You'd have to go through the whole process again. And then the process is so expensive and time consuming that the only way that you'd be able to make it work is to build a seven story mid-rise building, right? And that totally short circuits the capital accumulation function of normal, I guess, human action and economic development, right? So if you didn't have these things, all these rules, regulations, zoning, all of this, like you did a hundred years, or excuse me, like you do now a hundred years ago, you would have a similar development pattern where you're able to open up a small store, you have very little capital at risk, and you're able to essentially sell your wares and develop and accumulate capital so that you can increase the intensity of the use of land to something else to provide additional services. So what they talk about in strong towns is that in order for a parcel or a building, so to speak, can exist, it has to be able to pay for the infrastructure that serves that parcel. So in our example of the one room shack, you know, you're basically on a dirt street and that's, that's about it. You don't have sewer or running water, any of this. Now, as you accumulate capital, you're able to spend more on basic necessities of infrastructure. Let's say that, you know, first you wanted to bring water to your building. So that if you had your two story wood building, you could bring water. Well, then let's say you wanna upgrade to a three story brick building. Well, now maybe you can afford uh, a light post in front of your building so you can light up at night. Um, the, these are the kind of things that, that are required in order for public infrastructure essentially to exist. Okay, so you have to have private wealth in order to create this infrastructure for the buildings. You can't do it in the reverse fashion where you force all of the infrastructure to go in at first and then basically plan around what you can do for that parcel. So Strong Towns leans into this very heavily, essentially saying that today we built everything to a finished state to whatever the minimum requirements are for what that developer is trying to do. So that in time, there's actually too much infrastructure uh, built in for, let's say, uh, my townhomes. I spend way too much money on infrastructure that it normally otherwise wouldn't be able to afford because today I pay for all that as the developer, right? The city doesn't come out of pocket to pay for the streets, the sewers, the waters. I pay for all of that. And then I give it to the city once they give me my certificate of occupancy. So then the city is responsible essentially for maintaining all of that infrastructure. But the basic problem is a math problem they don't collect enough money and property taxes in order to replace or maintain that infrastructure over the lifetime of the infrastructure. So if your street only lasts for 25 years, over the course of 25 years, the city has to, uh, has to collect enough money and property taxes to replace it. And that's just simply not the case. They be, become cash flow negative on, uh, on the entire situation because they may be able to replace the street, but they won't be able to replace the sewer. So that's, uh, that's the capital accumulation uh, short circuited by additional credit and cheap credit that wouldn't otherwise be able to occur if we didn't have the monetary system that we do. So I guess there's, there's kind of two factors at play there in terms of the time horizon of the developer. The first one is uh, the sort of capital accumulation factor where in the previous system, when there was very little prescriptive regulation, you could incrementally build up your capital. So you would have, in a sense, a kind of shorter term plan for what your structure would be, but you would have a longer term interest in the success. Uh, you'd, you'd know that that land was yours and that you could develop it into something better. And if it became better, uh, you would stand to benefit from that in the long term. Whereas with a prescriptive planning system with kind of a high threshold for for entry and also this strange incentive that you've you've mentioned whereby the developer is required to pay up front for all of this infrastructure but then after they've got the license the responsibility for maintenance of that infrastructure goes uh, falls with the city you've kind of got this weird um asymmetry of incentives involved there whereby under under a highly regulated system people are incentivized to build up to this minimum requirement, but not really care about what the long-term costs of, of maintenance are going to be. So there's kind of short and long-term factors at play there, but it seems that the uh, this kind of modern system has 
strange incentives at work that would seem to incentivize people not to work in a particularly um, long term oriented way. Is that a correct description? Yeah, I would agree. So um, it, a lot of it is that the the short term low or excuse me, high time preference view of it is that we need to collect essentially as much as we possibly can up front and then we'll deal with whatever the problems are later. So the idea is that we'll collect as many fees as the government would. They'd collect as many development fees, planning fees, impact fees, uh, uh, permit fees, all this upfront that they possibly can and that they use the, that money either for other things or you know, they're, they may save it to pay infrastructure for, you know, pay for uh, infrastructure replacement on my development. Now, I don't really think that that uh, necessarily occurs. I think that that money goes into the general funds of whatever city it is and is used for other things. And it's just a, a cash flow income item to them. So there's no real thought about, okay, if we're collecting these fees for this certain project, are we using these fees to A, pay for infrastructure connections and such now that like me as the developer couldn't do? Or B, is this money being saved so that in the future, if we have to do something, if something's wrong and it's our responsibility, do we have the cash to do it? And as uh, Chuck talks about in strong towns, they, they simply don't have the money. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a much, it's a situation where your liabilities are increasing much faster than any income that you could generate. Hmm. Okay, so um, Raheem, does that, um, so the story that, that Kelly's telling there, um, this is a sort of story of the, the modern planning system and he's arguing that that's, that's unsustainable. So when in history did this start to, to change? Because the urban planning system was, was quite different in the, in the 19th century all around the world. Can you talk us a bit about when exactly this all changed and what the main political factors were uh, at play that that resulted in this this asymmetry of incentives a lot of things uh, have changed so it's really hard to compare the present uh, to the past uh, i think the symptoms that charles maron describes uh, uh, quite well are symptoms that we see in many aspects not just in urbanism but in finance and and the whole economic structure, uh, which has become distorted. Uh, uh, I think it's great in describing the symptoms. Uh, I think he's not paying enough attention to the monetary factors. And I think that's one of the most crucial changes uh, uh, between modern times and maybe the past, uh, which has made uh, things possible, not only bad things, also positive things, and accelerated some developments which would have happened anywhere and were positive, uh, the rules like technological development and so on. And fundamentally, it's not just an increase in short termism, and uh, you've pinpointed a little bit to that, uh, Peter, uh, with your questions, it's a mismatch, it's a temporal mismatch, which means we not only see uh, increased short termism, we see a mismatch between the time preferences of the population and the productive decisions and the production structure. So we have an overbuilding of infrastructure, something that Kelly mentioned at times, and we have a, a gap, a mismatch of, of, of the funds to pay for that overbuilt infrastructure. Uh, and a lot of cities, in particular in Europe, they force uh, uh, the population to take part in that utilities that have already been built and pre-planned. And so you have to pay your fees. Uh, there's uh, no way to, to go for more small scale, more gradual developments. You have to pay with your fees with all this already pre-built infrastructure. And that's part of the regulation that you need to match the grid that has been laid out uh, uh, for a development. And that's a sign of mismatch, not just increased short-termism uh, that we've been uh, seeing here. Uh, generally, uh, thinking in systems is a very modern thing. Uh, uh, and uh, it's the one size fits all uh, thing where not only political systems have been adopted on the global scale, but also the financial system and the monetary system. So we have, of course, seen a kind of homogenization. Uh, and uh, maybe we're going into a future where it will become more diversified. Uh, already geopolitically, it's becoming more multipolar. Uh, so I think we'll go in a phase of more diversity with all of the problem that uh, will come with it. And uh, we have seen in particular after the world wars an increased homogenization of political approaches and pro approaches in finance and the monetary order. And they've lent uh, to this uh, illusion that uh, 
anything can be plan planned and executed by well-financed experts and social engineers uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's a kind of hip hybris, uh, I, I would call it, and it shows in urbanism and it has shown in all the uh, different plans uh, for urbanization. And uh, uh, of course, the tradition, it's, 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 uh, it's much, much older. We had this utopian experiments of absolutism uh, already before in Europe, uh, where basically old uh, city quarters were raised by uh, a feudalist, uh, absolutist monarchs uh, to make place for modernity and this kind of modernity is really i, I think a wrong-headed modernity it's what i call the fatal conceit uh, it's the conceit uh, of a modern person who thinks he knows more than he can know and uh, who wants to impose in a kind of impatient way uh, his superior knowledge uh, on the population uh, which in fact usually knows best what their preferences and what the trade-offs are uh, not because they're perfect it's because uh, you have a better match in the long term, the more gradual process, uh, which always is a learning process. A gradual process al allows much more for learning, uh, whereas uh, this step-like arrested development, uh, frozen stage uh, process that Kelly has described so well, uh, of course, uh, leads to a lot of missed opportunities for learning. Uh, for uh, In the end, then you realize uh, uh, it's a distorted structure, but the cost of, of tearing it down uh, uh, is so high that you accommodate to it and you get to learn to live with past mistakes. Uh, and we're not only seeing that, uh, of course, in uh, urbanism, but in every kind of institutions which become ossified uh, and have all these sunk costs uh, vested in them and, and make, uh, which then uh, very well plays into the hands of this class interest to just uh, keep it going and, and, and increase. And you have this kind of growth to just a uh, paint over past mistakes. So we need to more and more and more and build over it uh, uh, to hide the traces of our past errors. Uh, and uh, I think we see that in, in many areas, but maybe uh, cities are a more obvious example here. Yeah, it's interesting. So what's happening with cities is kind of a microcosm of what's happening with the economy of, as a whole. And yeah. uh, this this lens of, of finance, I think, is a really important one that we um, that I'd like to discuss a bit more in this conversation as well, um, because it seems to be absolutely crucial to the dynamics of, of how cities are developing. Um, but I want to also put that same same question to Kelly um, regarding that historical development, because Kelly's written this really interesting blog post um, called The Suburban Experiment. And he's highlighted three specific events that he sees as really important to transforming US urban planning, uh, which are the foundation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, um, World War I and the Great Depression. So Kelly, would it be okay if you talked us through um, those events and why you think those were so important in bringing about this change in dynamics in the housing market? Sure. So with the, the Federal Reserve, you essentially have the creation of the United States Central Bank, which is, in my opinion, the death knell of uh, the gold standard, at least in the United States. So you've got the transition from uh, uh, gold as uh, your reserve currency to, you know, using Federal Reserve notes that are backed by gold, supposedly at some interest or excuse me, some percentage uh, mandated by the government that they'll promise to follow. So as that played out over the course of 100 years with uh, the US reigning hegemonic over essentially everything for a long time after World War II, that allowed them to use their exorbitant privilege with uh, the dollar to export uh, lots of uh, uh, dollars abroad as well as with the inflation that the US wouldn't have experienced. So with that, you've got uh, the king dollar, you've got the expansion of credit and you've got their ability to control the price of that credit. So that allows essentially in the development process where I as the developer am able to go and get a loan at below the natural interest rate. And with those funds, I essentially become a honeypot for um, the entire process to pick from as I go through it. So let's say, you know, now that I go through my 18 month process, I pay all of these fees, these review fees, impact fees, permits, all these things, as well as to all the consultants that are involved. I mean, there's really, there's really no one that's not, uh, not uh, uh, guilty of, you know, putting their hand in the money pot. It's just the, one of those things where there's, there's so much credit available 
and everyone knows there's credit available. So they're going to try and get as much uh, slice of the pie as they possibly can. So you don't really have that entire problem without the creation of the Federal Reserve. Now for uh, World War I is kind of similar with uh, Europe, which is the end of the, you know, La Belle Epoque. And you've also got a little bit different uh, aspect to it. And that is the trauma that was experienced by a lot of the uh, veterans who became uh, architects, planners, consultants, where their traumatization essentially, as theorized by some, uh, uh, basically increased their levels of autism so that they're unable to focus on uh, certain aspects of buildings, we'll say. So Ann Sussman and Justin Hollander have written a book called Cognitive Architecture, where they talk about essentially these designs by pieces, uh, people like Mises, uh, Mises van der Rohe, where they create structures where there's nothing for your eye to focus on. And that in doing so, that was a reflection of essentially their inability to focus on any one thing, which is uh, typically a, uh, 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 Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a, a, a symptom of autism itself. So that people who are autistic that are more severely on the scale of autism, I suppose, are incapable of focusing on faces for too long and they don't, they don't look and see what's actually there. They focus on things that are not essentially, um, um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they're, 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 they're not focusing on focal points of certain things. So your brain tries to recognize patterns on the built environment and people. So we've evolved to uh, determine uh, expressions on faces, um, look for essentially snakes in the grass, like am I in danger by associating with this person or being nearby something? And do I recognize, you know, that now all of a sudden there's the jaguar in a tree. So the idea is that your brain is constantly mapping the surroundings around you looking for danger. So that in this trauma, these architects essentially became part of the centralized system in prescribing how things look on the built environment. So let's say, for example, um, modern architecture and its, uh, its current stage, which is international architecture, all looks very the same. It's all featureless. You could plop it down anywhere and it's essentially going to look the same. So there's no local uh, hints or flavors of architecture or design or uh, things essentially for your brain to look at. Because your brain does enjoy searching for these patterns and architects, especially classical architects, did very well for thousands of years and essentially uh, teasing and pleasing your brain so that when you walk up to a building, let's say in Vienna, Austria, you're able to discern what it looks like from far away and then from a medium distance. And then once you get close, you're able to see the details and the, and the uh, statues and the faces on the statues and all these things. And this, this pleases your brain. So that had a tremendous effect on making our built environment essentially very bland. Um, you don't find any joy and your brain quite literally ignores all of, all of these, uh, these buildings or the art, all of that stuff. So then uh, the last one is the Great Depression. So the Great Depression is something um, that Charles talks about in that Detroit was actually not too much affected by the Great Depression as much as other cities in the United States. So at the time that was uh, uh, FDR's uh, first, I guess, election cycle or his first presidential term, excuse me, in the United States where the central government essentially was trying to gather as much data as possible and remedy the Great Depression situation economically. So what they did is they looked at Detroit saying, hey, these guys are essentially doing okay. So how do we take this model and apply it to the rest of the United States. So that began in the 30s, but really took off after World War II when all of the uh, men came back from fighting and the government essentially um, uh, subsidized the suburban experiment trying to employ as many people as possible. So that's when you get the American dream of owning a house in the suburbs outside of the city with a car that you can commute to work and then drive home to your quiet suburb. And in doing so, they were believing that they were creating wealth for the homeowners and that their homes were rising in value. Um, and that today we kind of know that's a little bit different and not necessarily the case because the homes aren't increasing in value per se. The homes are going up in price because the cost of credit is decreasing and more credit becomes available. So you've got uh, 
in my opinion, these, these three factors are some of the, or three events rather, are some of the largest contributing factors to the environment that we are in today, as far as uh, architecture, development, planning, and um, the, the, the notion that everybody needs to be in a home in a suburb somewhere, um, pretty much no matter the cost. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so I guess looking at that US experience, uh, I can totally see how those three factors would have been really important. Um, and I guess World War One was was common to a lot of the, the Western world. Um, and around the kind of same time the Federal Reserve was being set up, a lot of central banks in Europe were becoming more powerful at the same time and engaging in more inflationary practices around the same time. Um, but perhaps there's there's less of a parallel um, with the kind of Detroit example in Europe. Um, but uh, I'd be interested to hear Raheem's take on that. Um, so th this kind of dynamic, Raheem, that, that Kelly's describing regarding Detroit being seen as successful during the Great Depression and Detroit being this kind of uh, large sprawling um, city, which is really reliant on the car and it's sort of low density planning model. Other cities went and then copied that and saw that as, you know, whatever Detroit did, we we should try and emulate because that was, that was a successful city. Uh, but obviously now we know that that's really affected the the urban plans of American cities and made them really car reliant, really low density. Raheem, to what extent has that dynamic played out in Europe? Is Europe kind of better off than, than America in this in the sense of how it's planned its cities um, and have the same dynamics played out over the past few decades in Europe as well? Very similar dynamics, just belated and a bit restricted. Uh, the main difference is that uh, uh, Europe is much older. Uh, thus, the uh, capital structure was not totally destroyed in the wars. Uh, Vienna uh, was uh, 2 million uh, uh, people, city already in the 19th century. Uh, and it was among the uh, five largest cities in the world. Uh, so a lot of the buildings here are fairly old and they've built, uh, they've been built uh, following different standards and the more long-term orientation. Uh, so people have been more hesitant. And at the same time, uh, that uh, the development of credit and credit-based growth has not been as extensive uh, as in the United States in, in many parts of Europe has been a benefit. If you look at the building structure, you can compare Switzerland and Austria, for example. Switzerland being much richer, but becoming uglier at a faster pace than Austria, which is quite interesting. Uh, so it's, it's not uh, due to the market, it's due to a distorted market, uh, which has led to the monetization of uh, buildings, of course. Uh, they've become the major financial asset. And in Europe, it's, it's even worse here because we don't have a tradition of uh, investing a lot on, on the stock exchange. Uh, so it's like, it's the typical investment of a middle class is in real estate. Uh, and of course, once it becomes a financial asset, it changes, it's, it's no more uh, your personal home of your family that may be passed on from generation to generation and, and uh, shares a kind of pattern language as uh, uh, Kelly mentioned it, but something that uh, is a, as a financial asset benefits from being homogeneous, benefits from being fungible. Uh, and so that's why, uh, of course, being blend in a sense uh, uh, lends uh, to it being more fungible uh, and thus more liquid uh, on the market. Uh, and there's a rush for these suburban uh, uh, houses uh, there and, and uh, uh, they're always showing uh, an increase in value in, in, in Europe as well as in the US. Uh, so it's a bit lack of wealth, which here <laughs> has become a benefit uh, in, in, in uh, parts of Europe uh, and uh, but uh, on, on, on the whole it's a very similar uh, development uh, it's just that we are blessed by uh, a larger heritage uh, from from past city structures uh, past traditional cities and if you go through uh, many uh, European countries like Austria Italy France uh, of course that's a large part of the capital that's still uh, uh, used in an economic fashion today in tourism uh, uh, and there's a location for, for film and, and, and longing of people. So the Chinese are even rep replicating uh, old uh, Austrian cities uh, and, and towns uh, as a kind of resource uh, style. Uh, and that of course shows that uh, people
people in the past without knowing it by following design patterns uh, uh, have found things that are pleasing uh, to the human mind and to human beings in general and uh, pleasing in an eternal eternal way so it's still nowadays that the same structures tend to be the most pleasing one and the most frequented ones by tourists. Uh, and that's quite interesting because it wasn't planned uh, as a tourist destination. And, and it'll be really expensive to now reconstruct it as a kind of Disneyland style uh, theme park. Uh, so, so many European countries are blessed by this heritage of Disney style theme parks, uh, uh, which look better and are easier to maintain uh, and uh, have much more behind the facade. So you can live in these buildings and still have a fairly high quality of life uh, in these surroundings. So Europe kind of benefiting from the fact that it was built a lot earlier. Most of the cities were built a lot earlier and yeah. that core structure is still in place and um, perhaps benefiting less, uh, benefiting from the difference in the, in the financial system, which um, I do want to come on to in a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to kind of pin down, Kelly, the, the dynamic you mentioned regarding developer firstly building a new project in a city and then handing over maintenance responsibility to the city. Was there a specific point in history when that system changed or has it just been a kind of gradual handing of of like long-term maintenance power over to over to city authorities uh, through a kind of drip drip process. Or was there something specific? Was there one specific policy, a specific act that 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 changed things fundamentally for you? Uh, there's there's not a specific act that I'm aware of. Um, in my research, it's basically been a, a gradual process. Um, you you essentially started with when you were building uh, homes. You know, in the 30s, you probably didn't have uh, some are the best infrastructure. So when you would build something, you would build essentially what you could afford. And then if you were required to maintain that in your original agreement with the city, whatever you're trying to do, then it was your responsibility. So that's kind of the beginning of what's called a homeowners association. So even today, there are still there are homeowners associations where they're responsible for uh, the water lines or the sewer lines in which that would be deemed uh, private utility on your property. So the HOAs are responsible for repairing and maintaining that. Now, the, the HOAs have the same problems that cities do, where the HOAs are a function of essentially a political process within that neighborhood and the likelihood that they're going to vote themselves higher fees for the HOA to potentially pay for something that's not a problem right now is very low. I've seen this um, play out many times and I've heard many stories from my dad or from uh, friends who are in the, the business of managing HOAs. Um, so there's no real uh, clear delineation of when uh, infrastructure was built by developers and then you know handed off to the cities, just because as it is today, there are still cert situ certain situations where that infrastructure is maintained by uh, the homeowners association. So mm -hmm. you try to, I guess, as the developer try to keep as many costs off the HOA as possible, but there are certain situations in development where let's say you can't meet the, uh, the streets required 35 or 50 foot width minimum, right? So you have to build a street that's 50 feet wide. You do your plans and you know, that, that doesn't work. You lose, you know, maybe five or six homes and then that kills the project. So then you, you move to something like a 30 foot wide street and then you're responsible for maintaining the water and sewer as the HOA. And then all of a sudden that makes the project feasible. So it's part of the prescriptive model where the city, you know, is also playing the same game where they don't necessarily want the liabilities on their books. And that if you, you know, instead of doing this, if you do that, well, then it becomes your problem and we'll let you, you know, continue with this development. That's, that's kind of where you get to. So there's a lot of gamification of the process of the codes, um, and then you're, you're essentially playing tit for tat and trying to get things. So um, it's, a very, it's a very messy ordeal. There's no real one prescription for what you can and can't do. You basically are going from uh, project to project and working through the individual situation and trying to make it work. Okay, so maybe in, in the 19th century, you would just 
it was a bit of a kind of free for all like cities would tend to be built you know with with quite minimal infrastructure narrower streets higher density with people kind of living and working kind of closer proximity with mixed use neighborhoods and then as more and more restrictions came in uh, people were forced to make the streets wider to spread out to zone and this imposed extra costs on people and so those costs are there had to be kind of management system for those costs and that's what the city um to ended up taking on is that is that roughly the dynamic that uh, that went on yeah and the, as far as i guess the watershed moment would have been a supreme court case and i think it was 1927 it was amber realty versus euclid ohio and that was mm -hmm. the first situation or that was the uh case that established the fact that local municipalities ha do have a right to uh enforce restrictions on private property in terms of development so the issue was that um Amber Realty Co. was trying to build, I think it was like a five-story hotel on Main Street, and the city wanted them to push back the front of their building five feet. So five feet distributed over, you know, uh, four or five stories, and then you probably got like a 40-foot wide building. That's a good, you know, amount of space. And when it comes to real estate development, you know, it's space like that that is what makes the job profitable or makes the pro project profitable. So that when you start chiseling away at the edges of what you can and can't do, that's when you totally change the incentive structure on what you're, uh, on what you're trying to build. So if anything, that would have been the, the watershed moment as far as like controlling uh, land use goes, um, especially zoning had started in New York in the very, I think the first decade of the 20th century. So you've got the beginnings of all of that, you know, turning, starting right around the turn of the 20th century. So, uh, excuse me, of the of the 19th century. So um, that would be the beginning of a lot of that. So I do want to turn now to the finance side of things. And Kelly, I know that your, your blog is called Bitcoin Urbanism. And a lot of people wouldn't immediately associate Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency with urbanism or see how it's, it's relevant. So why is it that you chose that as a title? And how is it that finance and whether or not we have inflationary money affects the urban environment. Well, I, I do have to concede that I did not come up with the name. It was actually a, uh, a drive-by criticism of uh, somebody on Twitter who had a blue check mark that I guess um, didn't find my comments about current development cycle or uh, processes uh, very pleasing. So I, I kind of took that and ran with it. But the idea is that if you accept that Bitcoin is a sound monetary medium, um, it has sound monetary properties, it meets the qualifications for money, and that it's not an inflationary currency like we have today with the dollar, then that changes the, the dynamic of the available credit and the credit uh, cycles and the involvement of credit in uh, the built environment and the building process and the development process so I'd alluded to earlier that, you know, when it comes to uh, property development, that it's essentially a honeypot. There's lots of credit available. There's lots of hands trying to get as much, uh, uh, get a slice of uh, the pie as possible. And if you start to scale that back, there's no, there's no real uh, uh, opportunity for a lot of the parasitical fees and all that stuff to take part. Because if, if you have a sound monetary, um, um, if you have a, a, a money with a sound monetary policy, there's no extra credit that can just be uh, generated to go around and essentially stuff people's pockets, right? So then you're left with the situation, well, if the city is requiring all of these uh, prescriptive minimums in order to develop something, but you just can't afford to do it, then no development occurs. And then the cities have another problem with their uh, essentially growing liabilities where if there's no if there's no growth occurring and no income happening from fees, um, then how are they going to pay for any of this? So you essentially uh, hit a wall financially at the city level because there's not enough money being generated on a per parcel basis, creating wealth. So when you have a sound, uh, sound money that can't be manipulated, it can't be distorted, it can't, uh, you can't drum up credit in ex you know, excess of the total supply of Bitcoin, well, now you have to make much more rational decisions. Now you have to think about not just the current project that you're working on, but 
after this building needs to be replaced, do I have either the capital available or is there enough infrastructure available to support this, right? Or is the current property, if we take how things are today, if I go downtown and I buy a little building, you know, like an arts district building, which is typically a one or two story building selling art, right? And some of the most uh, expensive real estate in town. If I buy that building, am I able to make enough doing whatever service or product that I have in that building to pay for the bill that I know the city is going to send me? So the city will probably start doing special assessments on every single parcel. They're, they're going to try and get as much money as possible in order to pay for the infrastructure that they have to pay for. So I, I kind of started the Bitcoin Urbanism blog to discuss and show people that like under a sound monetary um, uh, standard, you can't make these decisions that we have today because there is simply not enough money to go around. You have to be able to make decisions that in the future with a low time preference that you know are going to generate wealth to be profitable and to be essentially uh, able to pay for themselves. Um, and today we, we simply don't have that because as I said, you, you develop the property once and you either sell the homes or you sell the building or you, you, know, you keep the building and then you get uh, a loan against it. So you're, you're leveraging as much as possible throughout the entire process. And without any of that leverage available, none of those decisions are able to be made. So then you have to rewind it back, say, well, if I'm buying a property and I'm not able to sell it to somebody who's not able to get credit because credit doesn't exist, I therefore cannot even begin this process. I can't even think about beginning this process. So to me, the uh, sound monetary standard under something like Bitcoin, I think is going to force a lot of this uh, prescriptive process either to be totally revised or uh, in my preference, totally thrown out the window because it simply doesn't work. The, the, the process disincentivizes any action, especially under a sound monetary standard because it simply just doesn't work. So through having a sound money, this kind of fiscal discipline is enforced on, on cities and the kind of Cantillon effects that come, subsidies that come from the rest of the economy towards areas where new money is created um, fall away and cities have to come to terms with the economic reality if they are to have a sustainable future. Yeah, I would agree 100%. You're not, you're not able to make the same decisions that you're able to now simply because they're there is not enough, uh, there's not enough capital to go around to essentially keep doing what you're doing. So Raheem's actually written a book on the phenomenon of, of low interest rates and how those lead to all kinds of distortions, not just in the housing market, but across a range of uh, areas of the economy and lead to a kind of change in the morals of, of people when uh, they're not subject to the consequences of present consumption over uh, versus saving. Um, so Raheem, what, what's your assessment of how severe this problem with, with credit has become and, and how severe the economic distortions are? And do you share Kelly's view that moving to a sound monetary system based on something like Bitcoin would uh, be a welcome change for, for the housing market construction, but also the economy in general? Yeah, I'm a bit wary to talk about uh, systems uh, and because I, I don't want to be perceived as a utopian. So it's not about constructing a system. It's about uh, uh, ending or correcting distortions. Uh, and I totally agree with Kelly. And, and these distortions are uh, partly, of course, uh, monetary because the city, I mean, the city has always been at uh, uh, one part, a market, a node uh, of natural network effects of people, a hub of cooperation. But on the other hand, uh, cities from the past have been centers of distribution and hierarchies, uh, usually based on human sacrifice as well. So there's uh, a dark side to city has always been. So I wouldn't romanticize too much of the past, but just uh, uh, at the same time, not think that we've end, uh, reached the end of history and, and be too conceited. Uh, the distortions that they maybe are different and, and uh, what's really changing, challenging 
about them is that they are not that obvious uh, because uh, money is one of the most complex phenomena. So those kind of monetary distortions, the bad thing about them is that they are so invisible to most people and really hard to grasp and really hard to understand. And uh, nowadays cities are still centers of redistribution for to, to an extent uh, which is not obvious to most people. It's not really just uh, taking in taxes. Taxation has become less and less relevant to the kind of redistribution that's going on. That's basically monetary uh, uh, redistribution. And cities, of course, are centers of money production and centers uh, of this uh, Kantian effect like uh, ripples that go through the economy. So we have a bloated urbanism at the same time as cities are becoming more and more important of hubs of a global division of labor. And that makes it really hard to assess it. So there's, of course, something inherently positive uh, in increasing urbanization, but at the same time, it's happening in an artificially accelerated and bloated way, which is not sustainable. And the worst thing about these distortions is the reaction against the distortions. And we've seen that in the past. And I think a lot of the ideologies that led to the world wars were reactions against the distortions that were already present in the uh, 19th century and before, uh, because uh, nothing is really new, it's just the extent and the dynamic has increased a lot. Uh, uh, but there's financial innovations, the monetization of debt, uh, uh, the importance uh, of monetary policy uh, is a long gradual process uh, that has been going on for a long time. Um, uh, so. Uh, I totally agree uh, that the essence is uh, uh, monetary and financial. So I, I think it's good to look at, uh, and of course what's driving a lot of interest in Bitcoin is looking for alternatives against those distortions. But on the same time, there's another side and it's it's on the value side. It's a more ethical assessment. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, many people who have been in Bitcoin for a longer time and are passionate about the share certain values and it's the same values that are inspiration to the free private cities uh, movement. Uh, that's uh, why we have a close affinity to Bitcoin uh, as well and those values are uh, the precedents of uh, bottom up tinkering of people with skin in the game uh, of uh, uh, instead of experts uh, that uh, somehow uh, think that they are immune uh, um, uh, to be measured uh, or, or to be held accountable uh, because uh, the accountability is really low of uh, uh, so-called experts in economics or in urbanism or in planning. It's really uh, uh, incredible how if you look at uh, the uh, intentions and the proposed results and the predictions uh, how much failure there is and how much is a sign that there's so many professions nowadays. And that's what I call the parasitic uh, class. Uh, um, uh, they are exempt uh, from this kind of accountability. Uh, and uh, I think a large part of the values that motivate the passion behind Bitcoin is, is the longing for a world uh, where you have more accountability, where you have this kind of uh, dealing with the issues of trust we have in modern society uh, and dealing with them in a more transparent way uh, and uh, by, by maybe even finding innovative technological solutions uh, to the problems we have uh, and, and really uh, having a more realist approach uh, uh, to uh, society and economics. Uh, and uh, so I think Bitcoin urbanism is a good term. Uh, uh, and interestingly, the term Austrian School of Economics all, also started <laughs> the kind of negative label that was pinned onto it. All those Austrians. Uh, and uh, it's uh, quite frequently happens that then you <laughs> stick to that label and say, fine, OK. <laughs> I, what do you blame me for? Or even worse. <laughs> <laughs> So Raheem, you're, you're the president of the Free Private Cities Foundation, which provo proposes that we run cities differently in a more voluntary manner, in a manner that's more like, that gives a more kind of customer-like relationship between the, the citizen and the person that runs the city, um, which is more, more kind of transactional, more based on consent. Um, so can you tell us how the Free Private Cities model might help to solve some of the structural problems that have been created by this 
system that we've described today? Uh, I wouldn't call it a model. I, I think it's the uh, uh, main approach is to open up uh, the space uh, of living together to competition, uh, but competition in the sense that Bitcoin is a competition to the financial system. It's not a model that you impose top down. It's trying it out and uh, everyone is free uh, to try it out. And if it's not a fit for you, no one is forced uh, uh, to join anything and it's behind it. So uh, I think there'll be different uh, models. And one part of living together is finding like-minded people and uh, be transparent about that value agreement that you find there and express it maybe, maybe even in aesthetic uh, uh, ways or by sharing a common language, which may be a common pattern language of urbanism uh, and uh, uh, I think the only way to address the trust issue which also leads to less public spaces in cities and so on uh, it's uh, and I think that that's an expression of a lack of a shared language and shared trust uh, in societies and I think because uh, the way of living together has become bloated uh, uh, so it's a scaling down to the sizes uh, that would work out and uh, no one knows for sure I think we'll have a diverse uh, we'll have a lot of small scale towns uh, uh, with quite a diversity in how they express the values of the population. We'll have a lot of failures of living together because one of the most challenging ways and then we'll have a consolidation phase where projects learn from each other and figure out uh, uh, what are the most stable way and I think uh, this kind of contractual idea is the best one where you have a kind of planning responsibility uh, of one entrepreneur, uh, 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 but who is very transparent about what he's going to provide and how it's being financed and who is utmost skin in the game uh, in offering that and not just doing kind of diesel and style resort, but with a limited but transparent role uh, to play. And I think part of the role uh, would be really helping people uh, to figure out how to arrange a very differentiated structure of rights uh, of living together. So I think one of the innovations we'll see in the legal sphere in the free private city uh, space is uh, very uh, diverse differentiation of rights, which will replace zoning because zoning uh, doesn't work uh, that way where you have like one size fits all. We'll have different sizes and they reflect a different structure of rights where one right would be, of course, uh, uh, someone will care a lot to have more light, uh, have a free view, uh, and it will depend a lot on the situation where you're at, at the location you're, uh, you're at. And then you can have this kind of bargaining processes, which are discovery processes of people. How much does it matter to you? How important uh, is it to you? And I think we'll figure out that skyscrapers potentially are a mistake, that uh, uh, they wouldn't really be economically sustainable if it wasn't without credit, uh, un uh, because I think they're mainly due to the very high valuation of some land, uh, because just one parcel uh, that you can have. And if you have more differentiated rights, and if you have to pay for the shadow that's cast by the skyscraper, if you have to bear in mind the long-term uh, investments that are necessary for the upkeep and so on. Uh, I, I think we'd rather have two to seven story uh, buildings, uh, but a mix and certainly not a one size fits all fit because that's not how we, uh, how we work as human beings. Uh, uh, so I think it'll be flexible, it'll be adapt adaptive, it'll be a learning process, but still showing some consolidation. So I think over time, we have to start uh, to learn learning again <laughs> in urbanism, and we'll have a consolidation of some patterns and uh, to, to surprise of some, uh, maybe some of these patterns will seem to be quite eternal <laughs> and, and reminders of the past. Uh, so in the most progressive cities of the future, I think we'll see uh, uh, very old patterns uh, re-emerging or being rediscovered uh, by the people uh, because they are the best uh, way to solve our needs if we um, are transparent about them uh, and if we are free to try out, tinker with the means to fulfill our ends and don't have this mismatch. Uh, so we, for free private cities, 
movement tries to do is really have a better match between the preferences of people living together and the structures that are necessary for that living together and the cooperation between people, which are a good in themselves. So cooperation between people is great. That's why cities are great. That's why cities are important. And that's why they will remain important. Uh, so it's crucial that they become more functional, more pleasing, more sustainable uh, for the future of mankind. So just as a final question, I'd like to get Te Kelly's take on that as well. Um, so Kelly, in a world where we had more autonomous cities operating with different models that were able to compete, to attract people from around the world to, to move and work uh, in them, what sort of trends would you expect to become more popular? How would you expect the, in particular, the, the urban urban planning uh, system that you experience uh, in America to, to kind of evolve differently uh, in a system where there's more competition between cities? Um, I think it's mostly around the incentive structure. So cities today are essentially incentivized to um, keep things under lock and key to continue forcing the prescriptive model just because essentially there's nowhere else to go. So they've got the market for living together essentially cornered because there's no viable alternatives, at least that they're aware of. So with the pre-private cities model, you have the complete opposite. So now you have the one escape valve for the those who uh, essentially have the same ethos that think the same way that are concerned about the same things, they can go somewhere else. Now, once you start seeing people essentially heading towards the door, more and more people will also look and see what's happening. So you have uh, essentially the Barbara Streisand effect where you can't talk about it because if, if these cities talk about a free private city, then they have to start emulating it because their citizens are going to demand greater freedoms, greater uh, uh, abilities to make their own decisions, to try their own entrepreneurial activities, to tinker, to try and fail. So uh, to me, the, the idea of the free private city is essentially trying to strip away as much noise from the signal as possible when it comes to uh, living together and in, uh, in my interest, planning and developing and building buildings so that you can really see what people actually actually want under that kind of um, um, standard. So uh, when it comes to you know, building buildings in cities, I, I agree with Raheem that it, the cities of the future, given the opportunity to make their own decisions uh, free of coercive top-down planning are going to look much more like uh, ancient cities and the fact that uh, people are going to assemble and do things that have worked and will continue to work just because of human nature, human desires, a lot of the, uh, uh, the profit incentives, a lot of the, the, the uh, things that we talk about and think about as Austrians that people will go to their value and they will uh, make decisions based on what they value and uh, you know all the other, um, I guess, kind of um, uh, what's uh, I guess the, the other incentives for them to do so are in place um, and you know a sound monetary medium is part of that and that you are making decisions not necessarily based on all the complex information which you can't know but that you are working with as much signal as possible when you're making your decision you're able to plan for longer you're able to uh, develop cities that will last longer in time, be more beautiful, have more public spaces simply because uh, those are what's desired and demanded and have always been. Great, thank you, Kelly. So I will be putting a link to the Free Private Cities website in the description below this video. And um, for Ke Kelly, what's the best way that people can stay in touch with you and keep up to date with the work that you do? Sure. So I have a, a, a Twitter handle. My personal Twitter handle is at KT Lannon. And then uh, you can find the Bitcoin Urbanism Twitter handle at Bitcoin Urbanism. And then uh, the Bitcoin Urbanism is a Substack blog. So if you just search that, I'm the, uh, the only result that comes up. So it should be easy to find. Well, we've managed to cover quite a lot of ground today. We've discussed how the urban planning system works, what it's like for a developer uh, to go through the planning system and what some of the incentives are for both cities and developers and how that may have led to some of the kind of challenges that a lot of cities face regarding their finances. And uh, so it's been a really fascinating discussion for me. And um, I hope to speak to you both again, again soon.
And I'd like to thank you for joining the discussion today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank Kelly. You. Thank, thank you. you.